parliament and no government can ignore. And in this place, of course, it's a tribute to Fred that he moved the first religious freedom bill in the New South Wales Parliament in the last term and uh, put uh, stakes in the ground um, for this uh, important consideration. Um, and the issue uh, is not just uh, about Israel Folau, it's not just about people in their workplace. Uh, we find in the uh, faulty abortion bill that's been presented to the lower house and coming to the upper house next week, there's also a religious freedom dimension that I'll, I'll come to later on. Uh, why has religious freedom become so important? Well, primarily because it's under attack. Uh, internationally, um, United Nations, other instruments have developed uh, conventions and countries in Europe in particular thought they needed laws and safeguards about religious freedom because they, they, had, they had these uh, sectarian conflicts and oppression over centuries. Australia hadn't uh, joined in these international conventions and rules mainly for the reason we assumed it couldn't happen here, that uh, the tolerant country where Christianity in particular has played such an important role, uh, nobody dreamt uh, 20 or 30 years ago, perhaps even 20 or 30 months ago, that someone could be dropped out of uh, their, their role in a sporting organisation uh, for posting on social media material that paraphrased from the Bible. Uh, the case of Israel Folau, this was unthinkable. Uh, nobody had imagined that there could be this era of persecution of Christians. So where has it come from? I think there are two sources that we need to be mindful of. The first is long term and the, the other one more recent. Um, in the long term, uh, left-wing politics is about trying to control people. And its original manifestation of that was in the old Soviet Union, where there was an attempt under Marxist economic ideology to control the way in which people ran an economy. And in the old Soviet Union, it fell apart because human nature said that people wanted to work hard and make more money and be rewarded for excellence and leave some assets to their children and economic competition was a good thing. So by that internal contradiction, economic Marxism fell over with the fall of the Berlin Wall and while we were celebrating that and sort of thinking that's the end of that uh, nonsense uh, dismissed for all time, in fact the leftists wanting to control our society regathered their forces and regathered themselves moving from economic Marxism into cultural <coughs> Marxism. Instead of trying to control every aspect of the economy through uh, government fiat, um, they've moved into a system where they're trying to control our words. That's the nature of political correctness, the things we can and can't say. They're trying to control values, behaviour and faith. And the attack on Christianity in particular is insidious because it's part of a broader attack on our civilization. A lot of the things we've taken for granted about Western <coughs> civilization, which has been wonderfully effective in so many uh, uh, countries in bringing, bringing progress, technological improvements and the like, is now under threat. And um, uh, Christianity, of course, has, has been one of the pillars of Western civilization. We don't wake up in the morning and think, well, where do we get our sense of right and wrong from, whether you're religious or not? But the Ten Commandments, obviously, are very influential. They have been a moral code that has... Uh, um, seeped into and, and, and dominated civil society and our understanding of right versus wrong. So to the teachings of Christ, I always say to my children that whether uh, you think uh, Christ was, um, uh, whether or not he was the son of God or whether or not he rose from the dead, he certainly lived and his teachings expressed in the New Testament remain the most important moral teachings in human history mm -hmm. and the lessons of Christ, even if you just take him as an historical figure, the lessons of Christ are more important today than ever before. So for religious and non-religious people, Christ is a towering figure. Uh, the Ten Commandments are important for where we have our moral code. So to undermine Christianity, of course, is to undermine one of the essential pillars of our civilization. That's why we've got the attack. I think the other thing that's happened out of the um, more recent uh, period is the consequences of the, the gay marriage outcome. Because we heard that the love is love and uh, the plebiscite went through and the parliament enacted and everyone sort of hoped, well, if the people advocating there have got their victory, that's the end of it. But I said at the time, and I think this has come to pass, that for the gay left activists wanting to enact gay marriage, it wasn't just about... Uh, being part of the Marriage Act. It wasn't just love being love. It was a feeling that 
forces in society, according to their world view, <coughs> had attacked them over a long period of time, and part of it was to get even. And it's a terrible thing for our society where there's a group seeking revenge. It's not just sufficient to get through the um, gay marriage legislation and, 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 and for gay people to have higher than average income and wealth and education levels and media access in our, our society. They're not satisfied just with that. Uh, they've got a feeling, uh, a jaundice feeling, that um, things that the church might have said and done 50 years ago need to be squared off, that uh, you've got an era of revenge coming back at the churches. Now, that's a dreadful uh, thing for our country. It's divisive, <coughs> it's spiteful, it's unnecessary. I mean, you would have thought having had a, a, their historic victory, they'd move on and enjoy their life. But no, um, they put these political issues back on the agenda and uh, it all came to head, of course, in the case of Israel Folau. Now, uh, I feel very strongly about the Folau case because uh, when I was member for Werowa, I represented the area where he grew up, a Mindo public housing estate, um, and the area where, where he went to school, the near public, and anyone who knows Liverpool would realise these are very humble districts. Growing up in Minto and going to school in Lunir, it doesn't mean you're part of the aristocracy. In fact, <laughs> as uh, working and struggling a person as you'll ever find in any part of Australia. And uh, the, surprisingly, the Labor member for the federal seat of Whitlam made a very good point. When they talk about Falau, uh, you're really uh, saying this is uh, multiculturalism in action. You can't be supporting, as the left people do, multiculturalism and not recognise that Falau's Islander community in southwest Sydney has found the Bible and with it found a real meaning and purpose in their lives. Now, you know, there are ethnic groups that have come to southwest Sydney and, and caused a bit of strife. It hasn't been easy, but you'd have to say for that Islander community in southwest Sydney, finding the Bible has given them a sense of purpose. You don't find their young people out on the street dealing drugs. You don't find them, you know, in, in, in violent exchanges. You don't find the sort of trouble that we all fear in our society. So the Bible for that community, born again Christianity, has been a wonderfully positive force. Here, here. And that 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 should be recognised. And and to think that their proudest product, Israel Folau, who through his sporting prowess, a star rugby league player, not so good at AFL, but then a star <laughs> rugby union player, uh, could be kicked out of the code for something that had nothing to do with his workplace. I mean, he he, he wasn't. Uh, presenting posts about the Bible on the field. You can have it tattooed on his arm or on his jumper or talking about it at post-match press conferences. This was someone exercising his private rights as a citizen to be a person of faith, to articulate that in the public arena, and it's got nothing to do with the Australian rugby union. But in this era of corporate virtue signalling, there are corporate control freaks who think that they can't sponsor a code and still allow free speech. You had the, sport, the corporate sponsors saying, we put the money in, you know, all of us thought it was for advertising purposes, it was really to sponsor these sporting codes so they could run them and to drive Falau out on the basis that he said something that people disagreed with. Well, hello, if we're to have a, a tolerant, pluralistic society, disagreement, disagreement is our bread and butter. We must have disagreement. Yeah. And all he's put forward is something that... Um, um, something that um, has been around for many hundreds, if not thousands of years, the teachings of the Bible. It was unexceptional. But to take uh, exception to it and kicking him out of his code is completely, completely unacceptable. And where does Falau go? Falau um, <coughs> now goes to the Fair Work Commission where he would have had two courses of um, restitution, uh, two outlets for restoring his rights, a religious freedom right, to have his employment restored with Rugby Australia. The first would be if the state parliament where he lived in New South Wales had religious freedom under its anti-discrimination laws. And unfortunately, we haven't got that in New South Wales. Fred had a bill last term. We've both got bills we're putting forward this term to write religious freedom into the New South Wales anti-discrimination laws. There's laws there that you can't discriminate against, um, against um, people on the basis of gender or sexuality. There should also be laws saying you can't discriminate against people on the basis of religion, be that Christian, uh, Islamic or a Hindu or any other faith. So uh, Falau didn't have that legal avenue available to him, which just shows you how skinny our laws are in New South Wales. And indeed, the Ruddock Review recommended that uh, this uh, shortfall, this uh, gap 
in the anti-discrimination laws needed to be filled in New South Wales and South Australia. Other um, states have, have got these laws, but we haven't got them here in the biggest of the states in the Commonwealth. And the second thing that Falau, and it's, it's the one that he can rely on, thankfully, where he can find recourse and justice under the Fair Work Act, is an international labour organisational convention that um, uh, provides for religious freedom. So I know people here wouldn't necessarily regard uh, ILO or UN conventions as their cup of tea, but here we are in a situation where, because internationally people have recognised the importance of religious freedom, and Australia ratified that uh, ILO convention, Falau can use it to say he's been discriminated against on religious grounds in his workplace, he should be restored to the workplace and, of course, paid the compensation for the huge damage that Rugby Australia and Qantas and other <coughs> virtue signalling companies have tried to inflict upon him. So that's the state of play. Uh, we now come to the abortion bill that's before the New South Wales Parliament coming to the Legislative Council next week. Um, it has a religious freedom dimension because the cross-party cabal